Okay, so we didn't have a preamble yesterday because of my tardiness. So um, the big picture of this class as we get rolling is that maybe up until the 1970s through the 1950s, everything related to hydrology was related to things like agronomy, uh, getting enough water and soil for, uh, for growing enough food to feed the world, um, getting sustainable yields from aquifers. And so physical hydrology, the material that you'd have seen in 452, g 452, was really gauged to that, physical hydrology. And uh, since maybe the 1970s, when people realized that some of the things that we were doing, that were being done by your predecessors, uh, were perhaps not so environmentally conscious, like just disposing of waste without thinking too much about where they would go, uh, cleaning up those wastes, dry cleaning fluids, gasoline, uh, heavy metals uh, from mining, etc., has been perhaps the focus of, of hydrology. So that's kind of where it stands right now. And so things have evolved from looking at groundwater flow and supply. And I had a few examples to talk about, but I won't. Re I don't think I'll talk about them in detail. But I, as uh, this past summer, no, summer a year ago, uh, I did a, some work when I first came to Penn State a long time ago in Roaring Spring. And Roaring Spring is um, a, a syncline of limestone with a limestone quarry on one side that sits uh, here on the left-hand side of the syncline in this, with a, a fracture zone from the, the crushing of rocks in the folds in the top of it. And this fracture zone uh, stops water that should otherwise go into the quarry, and it kind of scoots it off into Roaring Spring where Appleton Paper Company use it, something like 500,000 gallons a day to make paper, or used to, I think they're closed down now, recently. And Roaring Spring bottles their water, and you might be carrying it around in a plastic uh, container. And so we did a small job. Uh, they were interested in deepening the quarry, and the worry was that if you deepen the quarry, do you disturb this fracture zone? This was kind of a groundwater dam because the rocks were so tight in the vertical part of the, the limb of the fold, and so almost no water came into the quarry. And so we did some analysis to see if uh, by deepening this, you jiggle the rocks around enough to make the fractures open enough to be able to make the permeability large enough that you'd flood the mine. And the people in the neighborhood weren't so worried about flooding the quarry because that's just their pump costs. They're worried about drying up the supply of water that was diverted to Appleton and to the, the bottling company. And so this is kind of the, the geometry of it. Uh, it was relatively, it, this would been the floor, and they were going to deepen it in maybe 50 foot increments. I think DEP gave them permission to go down uh, one bench at a time and make sure that in monitoring what was going on here, nothing particularly bad was happening. And so scroll on 20 years, I imagine this would have been the base of the quarry uh, 20 years ago, and this was one summer ago, so a year, a year and a half ago. And it's as dry as a bone in there, so I don't know. So apparently something was done right for change. It's nice to, to, to know that. And uh, so, so that's the, the idea of physical hydrology and how it relates to the things that we'll talk about in this class. Other things it relates to, well, the shale gas boom as well. I mean, the big worry about uh, is uh, contaminating groundwater from fracking fluids that go in and uh, come up from the, um, the reservoir. Nuclear waste disposal is a hot topic. Uh, I saw in Science magazine the other day that the Finns are just about to start uh, with their underground nuclear waste disposal on an island in the Baltic Sea. So that would be up here somewhere. Um, every country, well, all nuclear using countries around the world have that problem. In the US, uh, Yucca Mountain was shut down in 2008 in the beginning years of the Obama administration. Um, I think to get Harry Reid on board, this is all ancient history to you, so that the American health care plan could be done because Harry Reid was the uh, majority leader for the Senate and he's uh, a senator from Nevada and Nevada didn't want waste coming across their state to Yucca Mountain which is just year, uh, on the on the nuclear reservation, on, the on a restricted defense site just outside Las Vegas, 100 kilometers outside Vegas. And so the U.S. right now doesn't have a plan for those. And so the Finns are the, the first who will start to do that. All the plans for it are to put it underground, maybe 300 meters underground, 
to put to vitrify the waste, to put it in containers, put those containers in other containers, put them underground with uh, bentonite backfill, which is sorbing and has very low velocity water flow, and therefore there is no agent to take any broke uh, radionuclides that get broken out of the container and take it into the biosphere. And so your first assignment um, will deal with Yucca Mountain, which is no longer uh, a viable site, although it may came, come back on the, on the, um, in our view to be used, who knows. Um, and so the, we mentioned last time one, uh, the homeworks are live from Thursday to Thursday, so that'll be due um, next Thursday at midnight. Uh, Jia Yi is there to help you with that. I think she's going to uh, email you on Canvas about her hours if they're different from the ones on the syllabus and she'll be happy to, to help you with uh, uh, that. And also, I guess, uh, if you look on, um, we, we mentioned this on uh, Tuesday, if you look on the course website, there are these little guides. So the guide to number one is right there. It's pretty cryptic, but at least it gives you a starting point to start thinking about things. And so uh, use, uh, Use Jai to get the most out of the course, I think. So there, again, open-ended questions, not a single answer. Uh, have to think a little bit about them uh, to come up with a, a solution. So anyway, so that's uh, that. Screen flows on, homeworks do, history of hydrology. All right. So the focus of this class, even though we didn't get through that yesterday, I'll go through to, you'll know my ways of doing these things. Um, is to talk about these things today. So, our plan today. So, we've chosen to talk about the most difficult topic, I guess, in contaminant hydrology, uh, and most contemporary, I guess, and, and enduring, uh, talking about non-aqueous phase liquids, which is what this, uh, of course, stands for. The light being lighter than water, and the dense being denser than water, being the, the code. Apparently, the folklore for this is that uh, in the Love Canal uh, debacle, where, was it Boeing who, who dumped stuff? I can't remember, General Electric, in an old canal in Buffalo, close to Buffalo. The Love Canal's infamous. It is infamous. You know it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I don't need to explain anymore. So, but the w lawyers who are trying to put a nice spin on it chose the word Napple because it sounded like apple, and apple, of course, is good for you. So the story goes. I don't know whether that's urban myth or not, but uh, so the story goes. So these are kind of the most difficult uh, problems to deal with because they work as two-phase fluids, not a single phase. Uh, they're mildly miscible. They dissolve at very low concentrations and are dangerous in, con in, in dissolved form. But their initial transport, as it comes from maybe from the surface into the subsurface, they flow for the first few months into the place that they'll be for the rest of their life as a source. They flow by the agents of multiphase flow. And multiphase flow is controlled by capillary behavior, which you know from thinking about capillary tubes. So our topics to deal with these two substances are to talk about immiscible transport, where you get a, a I guess a solvent or a liquid that doesn't dissolve in water traveling within the subsurface. Uh, to realize that the behavior is controlled by interfacial behavior, surface tension. And so since that is a control, take it from me that that's the case, we haven't shown that yet, we can look at the role of interfacial behavior on surfaces, how it in, uh, controls the, the subsurface transport in real porous media, and how we can actually quantify that. And so that's our, our goal today. So we'll look at a venometer, the single capillary tube, and how that represents, say, one pore within the porous media. We'll look at real porous media in terms of multiple grains contacting with multiple uh, capillary tubes. And we'll look at whether it can flow more quickly in fractures. So that's kind of our roadmap for today. So the first part is kind of a big picture of what's going on. 
And so this is, well, actually, uh, I have something set up on, on this. And so let's look at these movies first. Love movies. So this is a porous medium. It's in German, but the physics is the same. And the idea is that you can fill something on the surface through the vadosome, which is the brown region on the top, through the capillary fringe, which is the violet region above it, and then through the groundwater zone. And this must be a denapple, denser than water, because it's sinking to the bottom, just as you'd think in a salad shaker where you have oil and water, the denser fluid is always on the bottom. And then it sinks through the porous medium. The difference between a salad shaker and uh, porous medium is that it has sand grains in it, but that's not actually a big change to the behavior. And you, I don't want to do that. Uh, oh, hi. Hi. Who knows what that uh, is? Japan's uh, so, uh, I should have got to that earlier. And it's in German still, that's the only same. I guess I can bring it up. Well, why not? Because I did want to make a point about one thing that's there. And I'll add both of them. Don't know which one's which. Yes, this one again. Greetings. The red's the Dean Apple. Is that the question? No. Didn't we watch the Dean Apple one already? Yeah, we did. Okay. So, 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 uh, okay. Hold your horses. <laughs> the 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 question to us would be why does it stop at that lower layer? And you might want to think that maybe it's the permeability. It is kind of the permeability, but it's not really the permeability. The transport is by uh, the mechanism of uh, gaining entry into the pore space. And so this is a, a kind of a binary thing. Either it goes in and moves at some relate controlled by some other phenomenon, or it's excluded because the capillaries are too small to allow it to go in. So, anyway, so I'll stop that there. So now we'll go to the other one. So if we go, I think actually I can hit some button and it would automatically go to them. The same behavior you get if you look at flow in subsurface in fractured media, except as you'd expect, the fractures would act as conduits. They're quite open. From what we know about capillary behavior, if the capillary is wider, it's much more open to flow, much less resistant to flow. And again, you get the same behavior occurring. And that is that uh, I just wanted to stop it rather than do anything else. The, the behavior you see, I guess the important parts are twofold. One is that you see that it bottoms out at, at the bottom of this region here, which is because it's capillarity excluded from going into this lower layer. Nothing to do with permeability, everything to do with the size of the pores, which relate to permeability, by the way. And the second thing is that the motion of the groundwater flowing from your left to your right is carrying a portion of this, of course, if it went down to here and just sat there in a pool and didn't move, we wouldn't care about it. But it dissolves in water at very low concentrations, and at those low concentrations is, pretty, is uh, potentially quite toxic. And so that's the kind of behavior that we want to represent. Perhaps a better picture of that, or just as good a picture of that, would be these figures here. Same kind of behavior. We'll talk about the stuff at the bottom later. But you see, if you spill it from the top, it'll go down not quite so uniformly as a plug as you saw before, but it will kind of cascade down. The reason for it cascading down is that you might have within the porous medium some lenses that have much smaller pore openings and therefore it sits on here as a lens, it accumulates as a puddle, flows off the edge, ed edges and then flows down until it meets another lens underneath this puddle and then uh, breaks through at some stage and has this very irregular form in the, uh, in the system. And so the problem for us is one that if you have such a, an irregular distribution, how do you characterize it? How do you know it's there? If you put a drill hole through this and it goes down through a portion of this, then you'd think that it exists in some parts and doesn't exist in others, that it's not continuous, although it is continuous now to the, to the base. Uh, and of course, if the drill hole that you have is over here, you might miss it completely. And so we'd like to know what the architecture is 
We like to know why the architecture is as it is. We like to know whether it keeps on going to infinity or what stops it and what the properties of that material would be that would stop it, that we might be able to make some engineering judgments to say that, well, it's only gone down 10 meters, it hasn't gone down 50 meters. And so that's the kind of uh, questions that we'd like to ask. And so you could imagine all these different architectures. If you didn't have enough oil or solvent in the 55 gallon drum to completely get to the bottom, maybe <coughs> this is the architecture you get. Maybe there's a, it's a half drum. Maybe there's a dead body in the other part of the drum. Uh, and this one is where you have a very specific architecture with kind of repeating um, low capillary diameter layers. So these would be clay layers underlying sand. You could think of it in those regards. So we'd like to understand exactly something that would explain why those phenomena are the, the way they are. And so one uh, global way of thinking about how this works is to perhaps think about this uh, geometry. I, don't, I want to use a, a big, thick uh, pen. And so this is the same idea for a D-napple, no, an L-napple. So this is lighter than water. And you see that now it's gone down through the chimney. You could imagine, or take it on trust, that this little thing here is a puddle. And so in the previous figures that we looked at, we had these puddles sitting on top of lenses. And so what's happening here is that you can imagine the Dean Apple going down, smearing on the grains as it goes down, leaving some behind. So this would have the D L Apple at very low concentration in the porous media. It would accumulate here as a puddle. It stopped because it's lighter than water, and so it can't go below the water table. It goes through the Vado zone, which is right here, the tension saturated zone, and it can't get very much below the water table, which is here. This is 100% groundwater, and you'll know from 452 by definition the pressure and the ground at the groundwater interface is equal to the atmospheric pressure, 100 kPa or zero gauge here. And the reason that this is slightly depressed is because it has a weight of gasoline sitting above it, which is pushing down on it. So instead of having atmospheric pressure pushing here, it's got this weight of gasoline sitting on top. And so you know that this pressure would be equal to um, the unit weight of gasoline, not gas, multiplied <coughs> by its height. So. It's a bit of a scribbly diagram. We don't need to understand all of that for now, but that's kind of what's going on. So when the LNAP is typically kind of pulled back before about the D-NAPs just go and eventually infiltrate the water table per se? Yes. Okay. That's what we're talking about now. So, yeah. So that'll be buoyed by the water table. This is exactly the scheme, but kind of a homogeneous medium from the cases we looked at in the, um, the, the cartoons, if you like. And here you see that it keeps on going. This has gone straight through the water table, hasn't been phased by it at all, kept on going, but what has stopped it is what we will talk about as a, a capillary barrier. barrier. Which is just a fancy way of saying some material that has very small pore throats in it and therefore acts to exclude it. So the questions uh, are the ones that we'd, we'd like to ask are exactly the ones we broached. What is the architecture of this going to look like? What will stop it? Um, will the difference in behavior be for L-napple and D-napple? Yeah, I guess it is because we've just seen it is. And how can we predict exactly what this architecture might be? And then what possibility do we have to be able to extract this if we know what the processes are that control this. And so the reality is that if this is spilled, maybe in the first few months it will get to this condition and then it's not going to do anything. It's not going to get worse, particularly with time, because this behavior, as we'll see, is controlled merely by the capillary forces. It's held absolutely in uh, static by those forces. It's not moving as it would be if it's flowing in the system. So now, Perhaps you can see uh, on these diagrams, not very well, it's lighter stipple on this side, it's darker stipple on this side. 
So if water flow is in the aquifer, it's dissolving material and it's carrying a plume downstream so that if you have a compliance point somewhere away, it's going to see this dissolved portion somewhere downstream. So that's kind of the, the deal we need to deal with. And so we have to understand a little bit, bit about the, uh, the mechanics of what we'll deal with. And I'm going to talk about that. So we'll go through those, those bulleted items that we talked about before. <coughs> I'm not sure you'll ever need to go back to the, the source on this, but there is one book in the library on reserve by Jacob Baer, Dynamics of Fluids and Porous Media. A, a complicated book, but it's kind of what this uh, material is, is taken for, uh, taken from. Uh, and so we'll talk about uh, the types of fluid flows we have. So you probably know that miscible displacements means that it's miscible, it mixes with water, dissolves in water, or dissolves in a, in a solvent, which is water typically for our conditions. And so the best way to think of that, I, su I suppose, is if you take a, a drop of ink and you drop it into a beaker of water and you measure the concentration across that drop of ink, uh, in space, right? This is across the bottom of it, and this is concentration vertically. Then you'd have a, a skyscraper profile. It would be 100% concentration of ink in the middle, zero concentration of ink in the water. If you leave it for a while, that profile will change and flatten out. And ultimately, if you leave it long enough, the whole beaker will become a constant, very low uh, color and I suppose ultimately the concentration will be some very low concentration that sits at the bottom. So ink is miscible in water. Immiscible displacement is where the material that you put into the fluid stays as a bubble, a liquid bubble that doesn't mix in any way. And that means that if it's in a porous media, they can both flow together as two separate fluids instead of flowing as ink dissolved in water, which should be the case for miscible fluids. And so they're fundamentally different mechanisms. And so what we'll do first is we'll realize that what, from what we talked about already, miscible display, uh, so, no. immiscible displacement is important to us because that's the mechanism by which these solvents and gasoline, well, I guess gasoline is a solvent, gets into the system in the first place as separate fluids from water. And then we have to worry about what happens if it dissolves into the water and travels. So we've already suggested or hinted that maybe interfacial tension is an important part of what's going on. And so we have to design, define some parameters that allow us to, to look at this behavior. The first one is saturation of the fluids. And saturation of fluid alpha is defined as the volume of fluid alpha within a representative elemental volume, which just means a volume that's representative of the porous medium. So if you want a volume that's representative of the porous medium, you probably have to have one which is 50 grains across and 50 grains down and 50 grains over rather than one which is a quarter of a grain across because that geometry that you'd have wouldn't be representative of the whole medium. So it would be something that would look like, I guess I don't need, I need, don't need to draw it, you can certainly understand that, that a representative elemental volume would be a whole bunch of grains inside an REV. So you, a word that's used often in the hydrology literature. And so what we do, if we take the, the void space, which is synonymous with the pore space, which is the space between the grains, then the saturation is merely the volume of the fluid relative to the void space. But since we might have more than one fluid, it is the volume of fluid A relative to the total vo void volume. The saturation of fluid B is the total volume of fluid B relative to the volume. And so if you had, for instance, um, three different fluids in the system, so saturation of water plus the saturation of air plus the saturation of a napple, for instance, they all had to have to add up to one. So the sum of the saturations in the system, because the pore space has to be filled completely with something, 
it might be air, but it has to be filled with something, is the sum of the saturations all have to add up to one. So it's just the, the overall saturation is the volume of all the fluids together divided by the total volume. And so that's why they, they measure. There are some other definitions of moisture contents which are used. Um, soil scientists use a volumetric moisture content. We will use it slightly in this class because it's used in kind of the, the hydrology literature. And so the concepts of um, flowing multiphase fluid grew up separately for petroleum engineers who work with oil and water in reservoirs and grew up for hydrologists who work with water and air in the unsaturated zone and completely independently and have merged and are inter, in, uh, and interleaved now, I guess, but they did grow up uh, differently. And so they have some different parameters that are used. So the parameter of volumetric moisture content is often used in the soil science literature. Is anyone taking a soil physics 400 level class? The environmental system students often used to take a soil physics 400 level class. <coughs> and so volumetric moisture content is the volume relative to the bulk volume of the REV. So not just the volume, the porous volume, but the total volume inside this square. And so if it's one fluid that completely fills the pores, then the volumetric moisture content would be equal to, if it's saturated, it would be equal to the porosity because it's 100% uh, saturated water. And the porosity would be equal to be the volume of voids over the total volume. So if you like, total volume, this is the volume of voids. From this, this becomes second nature to you. And I'm not sure even that if it's the first time that you've seen it. The only point is that the, the, the volumetric moisture, moisture content is not equal to 1 for the sum of it. It's equal to the porosity. And porosities might be 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 percent. Not much more than 30. Unusual to do more than that. Um, yeah. And if you're a, a soil mechanics guy, they work with moisture contents that are done by weights, not by volumes. By weight, you mean the, like the oven mass, the dry soil and weight? Yes. Okay. By mass, yeah, mass or weight, that'd be the same because you're measuring on the same. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So it would be mass of water and mass of solid. So you take a soil sample, you put it in the, on the scale, you weigh it complete with water, you put it in the oven, you boil off the water, and you have the mass of the solid. And you subtract one from the other, you have the mass of the water. And so you use the, the ratio of those. And so the different, the one that we'll, the two that we'll use is saturation is perhaps most convenient for us. But we will also use volumetric moisture content. All right. Do we need to see that? No. These pictures are much better in color. They're from a book by a, guy, a German guy called Schwieler, who wrote this in the 1970s <coughs> when people first realized that these non-aqueous fluids um, that, of course, petroleum engineers had been working with for, um, I guess, 80 years by that time, in terms of looking at behavior in reservoirs, that these are important relative to the water table. So this is just an aquarium that's filled up with sand that has water in it. I think this is probably the water table here. You drop a Dean apple into it. It scoots down right down here. It hits the water table, and then it just flashes out. It could be, I don't know what it is that's in here, perchloroethylene, I think. Um, and it's. It's gone below the water table, and it's doing whatever it's doing between these. But we need to understand this kind of behavior and what's controlling it. And so to do that, since hopefully you believe me that I say that it's controlled by interfacial uh, tension, then we need to look at how interfacial tension works in the system. I'm not sure you need to understand Dupre's formula. We will never use it again in this class. But it merely says that if you define surface tension, which is the tension on the surface of a fluid, like water on a pond with insects scurrying across it, 
or water or the tension on top of gasoline in contact with air, then that is the surface tension. Then we can define interfacial tension as the tension between a liquid and the vapor of that liquid solely. So if you take two fluids which are in contact, say gasoline sitting on top of water, which it will, right? Because gasoline is lighter than water. So gasoline and water. You pull them apart so that there's a, a vapor gap between them. That vapor will be the vapor of those two fluids that mix. And the work that you have to do to part them is given by a material constant, the interfacial, the surface tension of gasoline, sorry, the surface tension of water, the surface tension of gasoline, and the interfacial tension between those two. These are all um, material properties. So I guess if you knew this and knew this, and you <coughs> pulled them apart and measured the force, the work, work is force times distance of separation, then you could get the work and you'd know what this was. Or otherwise, if this is a material property, you could figure out what the work is. I'm not sure you ever need to know that in this class. But it's a, a rule that exists and so maybe is worth broaching just for, for background. So what we're interested in is whether the mechanism by which this immiscible fluids, fluid or fluids, will flow um, both within uh, liquids and with the liquids that invade porous media. And so um, the behavior that we could imagine is that if you spill gasoline on top of water, you could imagine that if gasoline was, uh, didn't like water, it would sit on top of the water just as a bubble, like a bead, bead of water, like a bead of gasoline. But gasoline actually likes water, and you know that it will spread over the water as a sheen. So at, before it goes from being a drop to spreading out over the top of the water completely, you could imagine that the geometry it might have would be a very thin lens of gasoline, this liquid B, on top of water, and with gas sitting above the gasoline. And we can draw a free body diagram from thinking about this very thin lens. You know, this angle here might go diminishingly to zero, and likewise this angle here. But if it's finite, we could look at doing a free body diagram and looking at the forces that are applied in terms of this tension force, this tension force, and this tension force. Uh, these are due to interfacial tension between the two fluids, between the liquid and the liquid, the liquid and the air, and the other air and the other liquid. And if this point here is not going to spread to your left, if it's not going to do that, then these forces have to be larger acting towards the right than this force pulling it to the left. And so you can just do a free body diagram. These cosines, which are these angles here, which define, of course, the, the this is the component of that force in this direction, right? This is sigma BG cosine theta BG, this term here. This is the force acting in this direction, so we just resolve horizontally. And because these cosine terms essentially go to 1, because the, the angles go to 0, then we can just note, all it's saying is that um, this will only spread across to the left if this force here is larger than the sum of these two forces here. And these, of course, are all material properties. And so we could say something about when it would spread across a pond or not. And so that's not so useful for us in this course because we're interested in how they interact with solids. So if we take that the next step further, then we replace this lower fluid here, liquid A, by a solid, solid substrate. So this is glass. This is your windshield. This is a bead of water sitting on your windshield. And this is the air in front of the bead of water, which it hasn't invaded over the top of. And we can do the same kind of analysis. 
we can have the surface tension of between the solid and gas, between the gas and the liquid, and the solid and the liquid, which are what these subscripts refer to. We can do the uh, same calculation as before, but we can keep this angle. So we had that angle before, as cosine theta. And if again we just do this resolve forces in the horizontal, in the lateral direction, we get an expression, we get this equation here, which we can rearrange in terms of this angle, which is this equation here. And the <coughs> importance of this is that it defines a contact angle. And this contact angle, theta, of which this is cosine theta, is important because it defines the behavior. And the behavior that we want to talk about is something called wettability. It's a term that sounds bizarre, but it's, it's used. And the idea here is that if this angle theta is less than 90 degrees, then How am I going to write this? Solid. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. I think well, you have to find by theta. I that do. But I like to write. So you can look at the definition if you're already ahead of me in the notes. The solid is water wet. But actually, that definition, one of those definitions is wrong. So anyway. So, so if it's less than 90 degrees, it said that the solid is water wet. And if it's greater than 90 degrees, It's the solid is, I guess, the best term would be non-wetting. And the other words you could use for that would be, this is hydrophilic, never used in hydrology. Must be Greek for to like, right? And hydrophobic, to hate. And 90 degrees is wetting neutral. And you are right. It's, it's got it down here. This is wrong, I think. Uh, then fluid. Um, I'm going to write this as L is the non-wetting fluid. So typically, um, we're often talking about, you know that if you look at beads on your windshield uh, or, a, or a window, uh, typically quartz, which is the same thing that's used for glass, it's just quartz sand, is typically uh, water wet. Water likes to spread over it. And often it means that you get a mono layer of water. It's tough to be able to keep a bead of water on an inclined windshield. It builds up and then it runs down the windshield to the bottom ultimately. And so that's the behavior we want to, to figure out. The other manifestation of this is if you think about a capillary tube and you look at, uh, so if this is part of a capillary tube, it doesn't have to be a capillary tube, but it would be probably the most reasonable thing to think of. So if this was a, a capillary tube, then a water wet tube, it would climb the tube. If it was uh, water, it was water non wetting, then the capillary, the meniscus would be, the curvature would be in the other direction. And this would be depressed. So I haven't drawn these to scale, but for the water one, it, put it in the water, it would climb up from the water that you put it into. If you put it into, say, mercury, the meniscus peak would be depressed from the free surface of the, of the mercury. So, so often we're dealing with uh, water wet systems uh, in the subsurface. So this is narrative, but I'll explain the narrative in terms of this much more nasty diagram, but one that uh, perhaps now makes, makes sense. So we're, we're interested in knowing whether the water, what fluid likes the quartz or the grains that we have. And so this comes from Bear. It's from the idea of uh, a water-wet sand reservoir. 
and it's easier for us to work on the left hand side first. So water wet means that the water loves the, the grains and so in this particular uh, example the I guess it's the key is down at the bottom oil is the black black oil water is the white or the clear and the stipples are the grains so if you think about this arrangement of grains when the saturation of uh, oil filling up the, the pore space is high then you get what we will call a pendular saturation And so what this means is that we've already said that the, this system is hydrophilic. It, the water loves the grains. So around each of the grains will be kind of a monomolecular layer of water that really loves them, that you won't be able to shift very easily at all, which is my red. And also, in addition to that, there'll be small portions right nested in the, the grain to grain contacts if you think about a little torus or a donut around them, these little uh, triangular areas here, they'll go around the grain to grain contact exactly. So that's where the water will be and everything else will be uh, oil. And this is what we'll call, re refer to, is referred to as a pendular saturation. And so I guess you could imagine that if you put a straw into here and suck the fluid out, then you'll get oil in your mouth uh, but probably not very much water. In fact, you'll get no water. It'll preferentially remove only the, the oil. So that's kind of important thing for us to know. Because it's a zero-sum game, the, the porosity isn't changing, but the components of the fluid that do fill it can possibly change. If we suck oil out, we've got to replace that oil with something. And so if you produce a petroleum reservoir, you pump in water as a water flood to be able to push out the petroleum. And so what would come in to replace this would be water. And so this is increasing the saturation of oil. It's increasing. No, sorry, the other way, isn't it? Saturation of water is decreasing. Not. And at some stage, they'll be roughly equivalent to each other. And you keep on going, you'll end up with what we'll, we'll refer to as funicular saturation. And so that is that you have bubbles of oil left within a sea of water. There's still a monomolecular layer of water that covers all these grains, but perhaps we don't care about it so much because there's a whole bunch of water next to it as well. And so I, I suppose that pendular comes from a a pendant somehow and funicular is the same as a funicular railway right a cog railway and a cog railway means that to transport something transport people up a cog railway the railway car needs to be moving so the funicular part means that to move out this bubble of oil you need to suck a lot of water out and hope that the gradient is enough to be able to pull the bubble of oil out as well which probably never happens and so pendular saturation and funicular saturation and how they look. They look very different between uh, point A and point C and you'd also expect them to behave very differently in terms of what's going on. And so perhaps you could imagine that these two different behaviors would exist in the systems that we've looked at. And so um, if you look at this is the same, uh, we haven't seen this picture before, but it's a bead pack. Perhaps you can see that here we have coarse sand grains. They're actually glass beads, I would think. I, I imagine they're perhaps um, uh, millimeter scale. And here, the beads are smaller. It's not a great resolution on the screen. And this is uh, a napple that's come into them. You could, you could imagine, I suppose, that it's a denapple. It's already saturated with water, so this has had to push out the water that's already present. And if you cut an REV, a representative elemental volume, that defines this part of the aquifer, it could be 100% red, 
So this is the, the red saturation and the blue saturation of water. Red would be the napple, blue would be the water. Let's say from what we've just understood about the diagrams we looked at, that it's not 95%, 100% um, red saturation. It's not, but it's less than that because some of it is still kept up with the, the other material that's present there. So we could imagine that within this REV, there is a distribution of both water and the non-aqueous liquid in there. And we can also think that beyond this distribution, well, one important feature is that across this boundary between the two different gradations of glass beads, the capillaries in here are much smaller. So you could rationalize that that acts as a capillary barrier to stop this napple invading it. But there might be places where the pores are perhaps larger than they are elsewhere, and therefore you could imagine that there's this ganglion, as it would be called, has found a nice pathway that's gone through here. And so the other way to think about this REV, if you take an REV now, which contains both predominantly red fluid, there's still going to be the, the blue fluid in here as well, but there also there's an area here which is probably going to be 100% blue fluid and 0% red fluid, because it has none of the invading fluid, the red fluid in it. So we can think of saturations in these, these two ways. Uh, really, we're thinking about it in this way, where it is an REV, <coughs> has some grains in it, and there's a, a uniform distribution of 95% red fluid and 5% uh, blue fluid, and it's uniformly spread in those proportions throughout. This one is not so, such an REV, the REV, I suppose, we'd have to draw would be something that would probably look like this, right? This REV would be basically some proportion of the fluids, and this REV would be different. So I guess all I'm saying is that we have to think in terms of how we do our averaging because that affects perhaps how we attack some of these problems. Anyway, I think I've probably made my point, hopefully. So. Um, the narrative that's above this just explains in words what I've just said about pendular saturation, changing the wet phase saturation, and funicular saturation. So I've said those things, uh, but they're there just because I find it easier to do that. Uh, and so, so that's uh, the different saturations. I guess the other point to briefly make would be that if it's um, a sand that is oil wet, then the monomolecular layer around the sand grains would now be oil. The little pendular saturation would be oil in these crevices going around the grains. And as we pumped more oil in, not very economically viable, I guess it's pertinent to our course, that's kind of what we're happening, right? Inadvertently, we're pumping more oil in, we'd end up with this different behavior. And the funicular saturation would be beads or bubbles of water that sit within a sea of oil. So it clearly matters as to whether the wetting characteristics of the, the solid are. Most of the things we deal with will be water wetting aquifers. And so we tend to be on this side. And so just to belabor, the, not to, just to mention these points, if you suck the fluid out of here, you'll get oil. If you suck the fluid out of here, you'll get water. And so that's the reason that we're perhaps interested in what these different saturations are. So that's our qualitative attempt to understand um, what's going on. The last figure we looked at uh, said something about uh, this capillary barrier. Coarse grains, fine grains, and so clearly it's the, um, the diameter of these pores which is controlling the incursion of fluid. Um, and so we can use what we know, and I know at least part of the class knows something about this. I brought you a very special treat today, the venometer. Did we look at this in 303? I know s some of you, I know who was always in that class. Uh, <laughs> uh. The venometer. So when you're out on Thirsty Thursday and you want to see what the alcohol content is of your beer, 
uh, or if you're with friends and of course you can't drink because you're still 20, you can put it in a venometer. Venometer is just something that gives you the alcohol content of liquids. And so what you do is you put the liquid in here. If I had water, I'd put it in. It fills up this little um, capsule at the top. This is a capri tube, which has, you can see the, the hole through it, which comes out of the bottom. You blow until water comes out of the bottom. Liquid, so you fill liquid, up this capri tube. Is. And then you stand it upside down. You stand it upside down, and now this is open, and you can look within this tube, it's graduated on the side, to give you the alcohol content, which is the height to which this will stand up within this tube. And so it's really controlled by the surface tension, which would be across the top of this tube, open at the bottom here, which is at atmospheric pressure, and so it's a direct analog to the system that we'll look at right now. There you go. So. That's the venometer. So you can use any fluid, of course. Uh, beer and wines, you know, what are they, 12% alcohol by volume? So they're, they're actually, that's how I get my daily water intake, is that you're actually drinking 88% water, of course. Never mind the rest of it. Yeah. Oh, good, you do have a sense of humor. <laughs> and even whiskey, right? I, I can never work out. So proof, 70% proof is, is that? 35 alcohol content? 35. Yeah, 35 alcohol and 65 water. Uh, proof and, or yeah, because it's also 140. 140 proof. One, yes, one, is it 70% alcohol and 30% and water? Yeah, yeah, so whatever it is. So again, you're drinking 30% water. So you can get your daily intake of water that way. And so, we need to know something about the cap. It's exactly the same behavior as that. It's no different. And some of you have seen this before. We only really worry about the final uh, portion. Is. So you take a capri, you put it in a liquid. It rises up if it's water wet within the glass tube. Uh, it's pulled by the, in the surface tension between the water and the fact that it loves this quartz that it's, it's pulling itself up against. And you can do a free body diagram. And the free body diagram is just to cut this off here and to think of it as a column of water. It looks like this. This column of water has a height. You don't have to derive this here. You never will. You've, some of you have seen it before. It has a height. It has a diameter. I guess we know that here, because we can get to this point on a path, and then we know that it's atmospheric pressure here. We know it has to be atmospheric pressure here, so we can just cut this off. And it's like we're pulling up this cylinder of water by the bootstraps, and the bootstraps are just pulling up here along this uh, contour. And so the free body diagram is just the, the unit weight of water times the, the volume of the water. This term here is the volume of the water. Height times pi d squared upon 4 is just the volume. And that has to equal the force that we're applying on here, which is this interfacial tension, which is sigma 1, 2, multiplied by the circumference. Right. This is just the, the length around here, times an angle so that instead of taking this force here, we're actually taking this force here, because we're resolving vertically. Because gravity, which is included in this, is pulling down on it. So in other words, this is just the, the mass of water is equal to the, the vertical force. That's all. Vertical force is a surface tension. So anyway, so if we do rearrange the math, we find out that the height rise is four times the interfacial tension divided by the diameter and the unit weight of whatever fluid it is. And so that means if we make a smaller diameter capillary, it will rise higher. Also, if we're trying to blow the water out of the capillary, it will be harder to blow if it's smaller because there'll be more resistance to it. Uh, we, we, should, we could assume that. And if we increase the capillary 
uh, interfacial tension, it will also increase. So if we increase the interfacial tension, or if we decrease the diameter, we'll get a higher capillary rise. And we can think of a higher capillary rise as being more difficult for that fluid to invade the porous medium. And by decreasing the diameter per se, would we be decreasing the amount of space or like the amount of horizontal space? We'd decrease the space, but we'd, uh, we'd be squeezing it out. This is at equilibrium. Like squeezing it out, like squeezing out uh, the baby food out of those tubes. If you squeeze this space, then the fluid would preferentially go downwards. And as you made it um, thinner, then the rise in this would correspondingly increase. But it would shoot some fluid out of the bottom, depending on how far it rose as the dimension of the tube shrunk. Okay. So one parameter that we can define usefully is capillary pressure. And we'll use that throughout. In fact, we'll develop some diagrams which relate capillary pressure to saturation, which we already talked about. And by definition, the capillary pressure is the difference between um, the non-wetting fluid and the wetting fluid. And uh, we could do that, attempt to do that by measuring the magnitudes of the pressures in these fluids. We could also divide this through by the unit weight of water. And this would be divided by the unit weight of water, which is all this is here. And this is kind of off the screen, but this is, this term here is kind of H sub C. And so the capillary pressure divided by the unit weight of water is kind of the height rise within the capillary. So it's a, a physical explanation of what's going on here. The relevance of the capillary pressure would be that the, the pressure in the water, in this particular case, if we zoomed, zoomed in here, and if I actually get rid of some of this stuff, because I can, then if you look at the pressure here, this would be the pressure in the water. If you look at the pressure here, this is the pressure in the air, which is the non-wetting fluid on the glass. And so these would be the two components that we'd look at in the capillary pressure. And so we certainly know that the the pressure in the air is atmospheric. Zero, if we want to use that as gaze pressure. And so the pressure in the water is different from that. And that's because the water meniscus has a curvature. And actually, this water will be in tension. You could think of this, I suppose, as a suspension bridge, right? A catenary. Cosine h curve, that's a sus suspension bridge. So Golden Gate Bridge is held by the towers. The catenary that holds up the bridge deck, clearly you could imagine the catenary, even if it doesn't have a bridge deck suspended off it, just self-weight, a rope between two trees is in tension. So the water here, because it's got curvature, if you did a free body diagram and some analysis, you'd find that the water is in tension. And so if you use that here, the water pressure is negative. Negative minus a negative is a positive. So the capillary pressure here is a positive number. And it would be equal to the capillary pressure, by definition here, would be equal to the height rise just divided by the unit weight of the fluid. So, so that's going to, hopefully, that will start bringing things together when we talk about capillary pressures on their own. Because capillary pressure, I think, seems like an abstract term. Certainly, you can visualize better the height rise within a system. Yeah, I guess that's right. And so the most important deduction here is that capillary pressure is proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to the diameter of the capillary. And so if the pore throat diameter is tiny, then you have to have a very big pressure differential between outside the bubble and inside the bubble to push that bubble into that pore space. That's really physically all we're saying. That's all we're saying. So many questions. You wanted someone to yeah, ask. Yeah, not this many. <laughs> I'm just asking a handwriting question. Oh, fine. For the PC thing, is the little is that the weight of water by second? Unit weight of water. Is that R or the gamma? Okay, I just wanted to make sure I'm reading. Yeah. Thank uh, you. My my 
handwriting leaves something to be desired. It'll be better next time and be better after that. Christmas break is killed off. Got it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, two other things to maybe deal with. Yeah, a couple of things. So, so that's the, the big picture. So we've thought of um, a porous medium maybe as a collection of grains. And I suppose what we've implicitly thought of here is that we could think of the pore space between these grains as being little tubes. And a, a tube here, and a tube here, <laughs> etc. So you could imagine a bundle of capillaries. And so we could think about this bundle of capillaries being a, a stack of capillary tubes or pencils held in your hand that you're trying to force stuff through. And that's probably not a bad analog, but it's a simplification. Um, it's one that's useful to us. But the other simplification we could think of is by trying to honor this porous medium a bit more and thinking of a solid grain impacting a solid grain. And then around these two solid grains at the contact, we get this I guess we'd, we've already called it pendular saturation, right? This is our pendant. And that pendant is a donut that goes around it. And it has two curvatures. If you're looking at it now, it has one curvature, which is this, R prime. And if you look down on it in plan view, it would be a donut. And it would have a radius, which this would be the, the inter, well, I guess it would be um, this radius between these two parts. So this arrow here and this arrow here. That's the other radius. And without belaboring it too much, we could work out on what the characteristics are of this ring that's held in place. And we come up with an equation called the Laplace-Young equation after Simon de Laplace and Mr. Young. It could be Mrs. Young. Probably in these days it was not, but I don't know. And it says that the capillary pressure can, is equal to the interfacial tension between the two, between the liquid and the solid, and some sum of the, those two radii. One sum is radius, good catch, and the other sum is radius, pi pi, right? R1 is just the difference across the between these two points here. And R11 is this radius here. And so 1 over these two radii gives you the magnitude of the pressure difference. And of course, it's the pressure difference between a point in the black material and a point in the white material, the two different fluids. Exactly the same as it was beneath the, the meniscus that we had. So that's just another way of thinking about it. But the important uh, importance of this behavior is that if we think that stuff is going to disappear in the subsurface and that it's going to be controlled by these what do I want to do? I guess I want to do this, don't I? And it's going to be controlled by this behavior that we've seen here, we would be curious as to what these controls of the Capri behavior are on the penetration penetration into the underlying material. And so I suppose we could have um, a thought experiment to think about the different forms of the capillary tubes that we'd have going into this porous medium. And so the different forms of those capillary tubes, you could imagine if you turn this serrated geometry up on its end, so you're dropping a non-aqueous fluid through the top, then what we know about capillary tubes so far is that this is a big thick opening that the fluid will go into. If this radius or diameter is too small to be able to allow it to pass, then it will just hang up there and not go anywhere else. If the architecture in the subsurface, again turning this 90 degrees, is that you drop fluid into both of these, it'll get hung up in this stuff because it's too narrow a diameter. But in this capillary, it will just zoom down, go as far as you like, and keep on going until it sees something like 
a capillary barrier that, like this that stops it. And so that's the kind of mechanism that we have going on. So we have to be at least a little mindful of what this architecture might be. And of course, when we looked at these other figures in this, that was kind of how we explained it. The fact that we have these uh, puddles sitting with cascades off the side is because the soil architecture is granular with underlain by clay, sand underlain by clay, puddles on top of the clay, rolls off the edge, cascades down onto the next uh, clay layer, etc. And so it is the architecture of the material, but the embodiment of that material is the pore size distribution within the pores medium. And so clearly it's that that we have to worry about. And so we're going to have to think in future weeks about what that architecture is and what its significance is for transport. So the very last thing that we'll talk about is, to close this out, is that the two movies we looked at at the beginning of this were for flow in a porous medium. It was just kind of a continuum thing. It didn't do this lensing and uh, puddling in the system. But we also looked at fractures. And so if we think that pre-existing fractures that might exist in fractured porous media might be larger in opening than the capillary diameters within the porous medium that surrounds it, then we probably have to wonder about whether they would act as superhighways for the stuff to go from the surface to the groundwater table and beyond. And so how would we deal with that? Well, it's exactly the, the capillary equations we had before. Instead of having a round capillary tube, we have two plates that are put into the, the liquid. Water will, fluid will rise up between these two plates. It will rise up you know, along them as you put them in here. And it's exactly the same equation. This would be, we're going to cut it off at the bottom because we know it has to be atmospheric here. We're going to lift it up by the bootstraps here. So really, if we drew this out, we'd be lifting out a geometry that looks like this. Do I hear a question in making? I'm afraid to ask, actually. <laughs> so this would be the geometry, right? And this would be uh, the, uh, be the, I guess it would be the weight. Uh, weight of water. And this would be F1 and F1 all the way along here. So this is the volume of water. This is the unit weight. So together, these two terms are the weight of water. And this is the interfacial tension, which is going to be sigma here and sigma here. There are two sides to the plates. Um, the length into the page is W. And so the force acting, so this would be um, the force due to the water, I guess. And so if you manipulate those again in terms of this characteristic here, you find out you get a nice equation. You throw this away because this is perhaps close to one, and you end up with a slightly different equation, but one that has the aperture in it instead of the diameter. B is the aperture between the sides of the fracture. Interfacial tension of the water on the solid, unit weight of whatever the fluid is that's climbing up there. And again, if you have a larger surface tension, it will rise up further. If you have a smaller aperture, it will rise up further. And from that, we can do some calculations. If we divide this through by that's wrong, isn't it? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's HC. If we multiply H sub C by unit weight, it's wanting to pretend that it's. If we multiply both sides by unit weight, then we lose this and we lose this, and we have capillary pressure is equal to double the unit weight 
divided by the separation. So again, the two important features that act against each other, increasing interfacial tension or decreasing aperture drives a taller column, and it means a bigger capillary pressure, which just means in our terminology a bigger difference in the pressure between the pressure in the liquid here and the pressure in the air here. That's all this difference is. And we can use that hopefully to characterize our behavior. You can think of a bigger capillary pressure as to providing more pressure to be able to push a bubble of fluid into the porous medium between some grains. I don't know, did we have that figure up here? No, so it comes somewhere else in our notes. And that's it. So where we're going with this, um, at least today, we've talked about two things. The very first thing we talked about was the proportions of fluids within the porous medium. We said we could do it by, um, by volume, uh, volumetric content on the total uh, size of the porous medium, which was volumetric moisture content. But more usually, we use saturation, the amount of that fluid that fills the pore space. So we talked about saturation, how much of the pore space is filled by a given fluid. The second thing we talked about was um, capillary behavior and interfacial tension and the pressures and force, pressures really, I suppose, that we have to supply to be able to invade a porous medium. So now, the, our choice next time is to try and describe how those things are interrelated because clearly our system is not one of capillary tubes where if we look in the capillary tube, we either have red liquid or air. So the saturations are either uh, one or zero in each of those fluids but we have a collection of those fluids, just like the behavior that we saw here in this profile of different saturations, pendular saturation through funicular saturation. So we could ask ourselves, what are the relative pressure differentials between the two phases in here relative to these saturations? And is there some kind of relation between them that controls that behavior? And lo and behold, what we'll find out is that there is a relationship that links the saturation of water within the porous medium. 100% water saturated, 0% water saturated, and therefore, I guess, if this was uh, saturation of the non-wetting fluid, this would be 100% non-wetting saturation, 0% non-wetting saturation, right? Because they trade one, as you fill the pore space up with water, you drain, or you expel, I suppose, the non-wetting <coughs> fluid. And we'll talk about what the relationship between the saturation and the capillary pressures are for those different saturations. And it's, that will take us a little while to do, because we'll find out that there are hysteretic relationships which matter whether the bead of water is running down your dry windshield or whether the bead of water is falling onto your wet windshield, the ability for it to run down the windshield is very different for each of those two cases. So a porous medium is kind of the same. If it's been pre-wetted with oil, not with water, it has a different behavior to being wetted by water for the first time than if it was previously slightly wetted with water. We'll talk about that next time.